Good morning. I like that. Getting in, get ahead of me. That's what I like. What a beautiful day. So glad to have so many of us, uh, so many people visiting us today. Um, really, really thankful for that. It's great to see uh, people that are near and dear to me. Um, really glad. Hope you're enjoying your Christmas season. I know that I am. Uh, we have some very special guests in our room here with us today. We have people um, all the way from Germany, people that were a part of our German mission trip that when we went over there, we got to meet them. And we have Joel and Jimma here, which is so, so cool. We're very thankful for you. Let me get this set up so then I can go for it. Yes. Nope. Sorry. I want to be able to see everything twice. Okay. Now we're cooking with peanut oil. All right. The Branch, Hope in God. We are in the midst of an Advent series right now, um, which has been a lot of fun for our church. It's been an encouragement for our church. And uh, I'm really, really thrilled on the journey that God has taken us on as a church. And if you don't know what this means, I will try to get us up to speed so our guests can kind of know where we're at. But the scripture has a lot to say in the Old Testament about Jesus um, being prophesied as a branch. He would be a branch. He would, he would grow into this majestic thing that would fulfill all the promises that he has given in the Old Testament. And so it's been a real joy. We also, for our Christmas Eve service, which is Tuesday at 5 o'clock, we will kind of continue this theme a little bit in our service. We have some guest artists with us on Tuesday night, Melody and Truth. That is uh, Nate Dunn and his family. They're a really, really wonderful artists, and they're going to be joining us for the Christmas Eve service. So I hope that you'll take some time to, to, to be there. I want to just make a plug for Christmas Eve, or in general, what I call Christmas intentionality. I, I can tell you that I'm very much like you. I experience life a lot like you do, and I know what it feels like at Christmas from making sure we have these things in order and from gifts or from being with family, whatever is the priority in your home, it can feel a little bit fast paced. And I can guarantee the thing that will tend to go to the side is making Jesus central in your home. He will be the last thing. Like, think about it. We don't forget the presents and we won't forget the meal and we won't forget the gathering. We won't forget game night. But giving God a central place in our home during the holidays can be a challenge. It can be a challenge for me as well. And I cannot tell you what God will do with just a little bit of intentionality. Whether it's just, you know, maybe doing some carol, singing some things of, of deep truth, right? So many of our carols have wonderful theology in them. Or maybe it's just slowing down to read some type of devotional. Or just have a God conversation with your family. What has God um, done for you in this past year? Um, just be intentional, okay? Be intentional. And uh, the 24th is a wonderful way to do that. It's a one-hour service. It will exalt and magnify Jesus, and it will help your hearts be um, put into the right place. The branch, a hope in God. I'm really excited, so you're going to have to Fasten your seatbelts, because I love the topic that we have today. Christmas is about the big being made small. It's about the big being made small. One of my favorite ways to uh, consume theology are children's books. They're way better than a lot of the smarty pants big books, just so you know. They're excellent, and we try to offer some of those here as a resource for you all. Thoughts to Make Your Heart Sing by Sally Lloyd-Jones is just a wonderful book to read with your children, to begin to understand who God is and what he's doing in the world and why you're here and how to live a joyful, fulfilled life. And on her chapter on Psalms 8 verses 3 and 4, she begins trying to explain to children the immensity of God. It says that God made the universe with his fingertips. I guess that's what I envision. No, 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 no. Done. Made. And it says there, if the Milky Way were the size of North America, that's quite large, 
Our solar system would be a coffee cup. And earth would be a speck of dust inside that cup. And each of us is a speck on the speck inside that cup. And I think sometimes we need to meditate on the grandeur of the universe. God made the heavens so that we would understand a part of his nature. The immensity, the scope of the universe. And if our Milky Way is the size of the United States of America and our, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, the Milky Way is the size of America and our solar system is just a cup of coffee in that vast space and then we're inside that coffee cup and we're nothing but a speck inside of a speck. And our puny minds cannot wrap our heads around it. Vastly, hugely, mind-boggling how big this universe truly is. But we need to realize that at Christmas time, it's about the big being made small. And it'll help you and myself immensely. We've been looking at the hope that is found in the scriptures about the prophecies of the branch. So I'm going to try to get us a running head start here. Israel had been promised that a seed would come all the way back from Genesis chapter 3 and then later on to Abraham. And there would be a line, there would be a hero that would come up, come through there one day and make all things right. There would be a rule and reign through the line of David, a throne that would be established forever and ever. And no matter how bad it got, no matter how dire, no matter how much men failed, right? And we see that through the, the people of Israel. They're like a, a way for us to understand even our own failure. That no matter how bad it got, no matter how difficult it would become, the seed would come and become a branch that would rescue mankind. And I love that verse in Isaiah chapter 6. At the very end there, there's still a seed in that stump. And so we've been taking a look at the fourfold descriptions of this branch in the Old Testament. And um, it reveals Christ as a man in Zechariah 6, 9. It reveals Christ as a servant as was preached last week in Zechariah 3. It reveals Christ as God. It will reveal Christ as king. And what's interesting about, of course, those four fold approach it's the way that the gospels are laid out for us isn't that interesting Matthew shows Jesus as king and Mark is Jesus displayed as a servant for us and Luke is a man and John as God and this journey has been a good one when Tom preached on this behold the man whose name is the branch the person who would come and rescue and make things right had to be a man he had to be like you and me he had to be someone to redeem us from the inside, not just from the outside. And when Christ is our servant, for behold, I am bringing forth my servant, the branch. And we saw so beautifully last week what this servant looked like. The, 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 the ultimate servant, Jesus, laying down his life, taking on the form of humankind and being slaughtered and being elevated. I don't know about you, but I was really motivated this past week to serve like Jesus because of our sermon on Sunday. I was just, it was on my mind all the time. Oh, I'm going to deny myself. How can I give up my rights and privileges in this scenario to exalt somebody else and display Christ? And now we're taking a look at how the branch is God himself. Isaiah 4, 2. In that day, the branch of the Lord shall be beautiful and glorious. And it's going to be a wonderful journey. So let's go there real quick. Go to Isaiah chapter 4. It's just a launching pad. It's just a launching pad. I will not dig deeply into this passage. But go to Isaiah chapter 4. Beginning in verse 2. Maybe we'll just read 2 and 3 here. In that day the branch of the Lord shall be beautiful and glorious. And the fruit of the land shall be the pride and honor of the survivors of Israel. And he who is left in Zion and remain in Jerusalem will be called holy. Everyone who has been recorded for life in Jerusalem. I was in there. But then you get more prophecy of what this branch who is God will do. He will beautify. He will de deal with sin. And then next week, we'll reveal that this branch is our king 
found in Jeremiah 23, 5. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will raise up to David a branch of righteousness. A king shall reign and prosper. And it's been an exciting journey to go that route. And today we look at the branch of the Lord, the sprout of Jehovah. This is the title of Messiah who comes as a shoot from the seeming dead stump of David's dynasty. And the other branches have showed different aspects of Jesus' humanity. But this one emphasizes Jesus' deity. This branch is from Yahweh. This branch is the Lord. And he is of the Godhead. And so as, as I've been meditating on Isaiah 4, it propels me into the Christmas story in Matthew 1.21. Go there, because I want you to read that yourself before I put it on the screen. And in Matthew chapter 1, we get the introduction of the birth of Christ. And in 21, we hear something that is so full of promise and hope, but it's also so full of story. There are so many layers to what is mentioned in verse 21. And he... Will bring forth a, and she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. And so what we saw in Isaiah chapter 4 was that God was going to be bringing forth himself into the story, into the situation. And this branch that is promised in Isaiah 4, 2 is now coming to fruition in the baby Jesus. And so what I want to do today is I want to take a look at four things as we think about God with us, about Jesus becoming man, about God showing up. And I want to look at the promise, the problem, the way and the wonder. The promise, the problem, the way, and the wonder. And I hope that your hearts will be filled with adoration for who Jesus is and what he has done. And I hope that you will also walk away with encouragement to live the life that you have in front of you because God showed up. Let's pray and ask God's help. Lord, I pray that you would help us today as we delve into this uh, passage, Lord, as we think deeply about the fact that you promised that God would show up, that God would come and he would make things right and that he would provide a way. And Lord, this is what it's about at Christmas time. It's about something that is almost too much for us to comprehend, something that feels a thousand miles away, something that almost feels that we can't really approach, becomes approachable, becomes tangible. Lord, and I pray that you would glorify yourself as we meditate on this thought today about God becoming flesh, about Jesus showing up, about Emmanuel. Help us now, Spirit, in Jesus' name, amen. The promise, this promise of God being with us is no new thing. And so I know um, you're going to drink out of a fire hydrant, but that's okay. I will be with you is a common phrase that is all over the Old Testament. It's the way that God interacted with his people. It was things that he would promise to them. You obey, you follow, you keep my covenant. I will be with you. I will be with you over and over again. We see it in Genesis 26.3. Live here as a foreigner in this land and I will be with you. Genesis 31, 3, go back to the land of your fathers and to your relatives, and I will be with you. And of course, you know, he, he heads back. Le uh, Leviticus 26, 11, 12, moreover, I will make my dwelling among you, and my soul will not reject you. I will also walk among you and be your God, and you shall be my people. Joshua 1, 5, as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you or forsake you. 1 Kings eleven thirty eight. as David my servant did, uh, as David my servant did, I will be with you. It continues, Isaiah seven fourteen, the famous passage prophetically that we just 
tied together. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel, which we know means God with us. Isaiah 43, 2, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. One of my favorite scriptures. It's not if you go through deep waters, it's when. I will be with you. I will be Emmanuel to you. And we think of just the famous passage in Psalm 23. It brings comfort to so many people. But what does it teach us? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why would I not fear? Because you are with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. This is not a new concept that God sought to comfort his people with his presence. And it's important for us to know that. Because that promise is out there. It's hanging out there for us to go, God will be with me. God, God, will, God will support me. If I go through a trial, God is there. When I face difficulties, God will be there. And it's something that brings great hope and promise to us. And it's what really hinges or brings to life this whole concept of Emmanuel. You have to understand that God has always been for you. God before the foundations of the earth has been for you and longed to be with you and hopes again to restore through his son the ability to be with you. He was for us before he became God with us and it was because he was for us that he became God with us. Do you understand that? God has always longed to commune and be in your life. And some of you in here, we have people in here, I know, that are seekers, that are kind of like open to to what God is doing. Maybe you really enjoy some of the things you're hearing in church. You know, maybe you're just also full of doubt. Welcome to the club. There's things that you doubt, but there's something in your heart you're longing to go, is this God real? Is this God accessible? Is this God tangible? And it's something that God has always been for. He's longed to be close and near to us. Emmanuel speaks of the incarnation of Christ, of God in the flesh. The promise has always been there, and it's wrapped up in the concept of Emmanuel. Spurgeon said of Emmanuel, the concept, I love these things. It's eternity sonnet. Heaven's hallelujah, the shout of the glorified, the song of the redeemed, the chorus of angels, the everlasting oratory of the great orchestra of the sky. See, I think sometimes we hear the word Emmanuel and it just kind of bounces off. We're so comfortable. We're so used to hearing it at Christmas time. John Wesley on his deathbed said, the best of all is God with us. His brother would write one of my favorite lines of all the carols that we sing. Veiled in flesh, the Godhead see. Hail the incarnate deity. Pleased as man with men to dwell, Jesus our Emmanuel. I love that. When you really meditate on what's being taught there, what an amazing thing that God is with us. We see the ex- exact imprint and nature of who God is. We can read about these things in Colossians 1. We can read about them in Hebrews chapter 1. It's an amazing thing that God has promised to be with us. And he's kept his promise through his son by sending Jesus to be in the flesh. And there's implications of this great thought. There's implications of the fact that God kept his word. See, God did not send Christ to us. God came to us in Christ. God really was on this earth. God really was present, physically tangible. You read 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. They're trying to make affirmations that Jesus is the real deal. Why? Because our eyes have seen him, our ears have heard him, our hands have touched him. And if you will believe that, we can have fellowship with one another. God really showed up. God came near, Matthew 1, 21. God came near, but God will stay near, Matthew 28, 20. He finishes Matthew with what? The Great Commission. And he tells them, go into all the world, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And lo, I am with you always. 
It's an amazing thought because God showed up, God will stay, and God cares. It says in Revelations 21, one day we will have our dwelling place with God. He will wipe away every tear from our eye. God cares. And these are what the implications are if you really understand that a promise was made, that a branch would be coming, and this branch would be God himself, not just manifestations, not just, you know, aspects or, no, God himself would show up, and he did, and it's a great promise. I think of this when, uh, when I really meditate on the fact that God cares. This is from Randy Alcorn. God's love comes to us soaked in divine blood. One look at Jesus, his incarnation and redemption he provided should silence the argument that God has withdrawn to some far corner of the universe where he keeps his hands clean, maintaining his distance from the human suffering. God doesn't merely empathize with our sufferings. He actually suffers. Jesus is God. What Jesus suffered, God suffered. Christ, incarnation, and atonement provide the ultimate demonstration of his love. And there's so many things to be thankful for today. But as we think of the fact that God showed up, that God came, that God kept his promise, one of the things that quickly comes to my heart is that God cares. God cares. What a wonderful and beautiful thing. But our second point is the problem. <laughs> the problem. What a wonderful promise, Chago. My heart's encouraged at the thought that God cares. God showed up. God will be there forever. He kept his word. But we have a big problem. As I meditate about the incarnation and about God showing up and keeping his word, my mind thinks of a big problem. And I think the only way for me to understand this problem is to start with God's holiness. With God's holiness. And I think that we'll never appreciate what God has done by coming to earth and being born and living a life that I could not live and dying a death I should have died without understanding his holiness. Tozer says, if we do not understand the weight of the miracle of incarnation. So right now, if, is your heart a little flat about incarnation? I'm challenging you a little bit. On a scale of one to ten, you're like, huh, thanks Jesus, appreciate that. The only reason it's really flat, and I really agree, is because we do not understand the weight of the holiness of God. The only reason it can fall flat on your heart is because you're living in delusion. You're living in this delusional place that God is accessible. He's around the corner. He'll, you can reach out to him and no problem. You and I are in delusion if we don't understand that God is unbelievably and utterly holy. And we shouldn't have this kind of access to God. We should not have the ability to go towards Him or even be in His presence. The Scriptures teach us that He is unapproachable light. It also, we know through the storyline of the Old Testament that He's an inaccessible God. Like, I can't help but read through the Old Testament and go, wait a second. It seems pretty hard to interact with God. Stuff's got to get slaughtered, priests have to be enacted, temples have to be built. Like, it seems like a lot of work to go hang out with God. Yes, because he's very inaccessible. And you don't read this bold access that you have in the, old, in the New Testament. And so there's a major problem, unapproachable light. God is above and beyond us. It says in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 16, Who alone is immortal? And who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see, to, be, to him be honor and might forever. Do you understand that? I know I, it doesn't hit me like it should. God is unapproachable. Man, apart from Christ, could never get to God. Ever, ever, ever. No one would live perfectly enough. No one would merit being in his presence having a relationship with him. He is unapproachable light. And so we can't get access to him. And if that's not enough for us to understand, there's a whole story of God's people in the Old Testament who demonstrate to us over and over and over how inaccessible God is. 
I think of Abraham. He's kind of in a sleepy stupor in Genesis 15. And he sees God basically like a, like a hot fire. And he doesn't know how to deal with that. And he senses and he sees a fire going through this, these animal parts. Go read it. All right. It's good stuff. Or you see Moses. You cannot see my face for no man shall see God and live. So he hides him in the cleft of the rock. He sees like, they, we call it the heel. And his light, his face lights up like a Christmas bulb. <laughs> and they have to kind of cover it because it's, it's blinding people. And he just saw some small aspect of God. Ezekiel tries to get close in chapter 1 and he falls on his face. Guys, I, I can't emphasize enough. I could go and take you there. I don't have the time. But every time people wanted to interact with God, their life was on the line. Even when God's, the, the glory of God in a cloud came down onto Mount Sinai, people were dying left and right. Don't you get near that mountain. Don't you get near that cloud. That's the glory of God and you will die. People tried to get into the holies of holies. They... All that they had to do to make that happen once a year, all the slaughter, all the blood, just to have one guy get in there once a year. God is inex inaccessible. He's not this convenient thing. People die around the presence of God. And that is a major problem. For you to commune and communicate and have a relationship with God. It's a massive problem. And so this promise of I will be with you. I will be with you. It's kind of like at times. Is it, are you playing around with me God? Are you really going to be with me or not with me? What is it going to be? You promise that our, your dwelling place will be with us. It's a shocking thought. This is from Jenkins. The incarnation is a shocking miracle. In Christ, God has effected self-disclosure. Our holy God who told Moses, for man shall not see me and live, became incarnate. Carne. We know that, right? We all love a good carne, right? People saw him and lived. Our holy God, check this out, who struck down a man for touching the ark and another 50,000 for looking inside of it, became incarnate. People spit upon him and lived. What a thought. That's just blowing my mind right now. He was born as a baby in a manger and not a throne. Our holy God who demanded blood sacrifices to atone for sin became the sacrifice himself. He allowed himself to be butchered on a cross. Unapproachable light inaccessible you're not going to get near me without dying makes himself flesh to be spit on we have a problem <laughs> we have a big problem and there's a gulf between me and god my sin my weakness my failure my pollution his holiness it's a big problem so this promise of god with us that God dwelling and communing and getting me back to that garden relationship, right? Where Adam and Eve communed with God. Seems far away when I think about my own life and my own failures. And so, I'm telling you, I've just been meditating a lot. Not only is there a promise... And there is a problem, but the scriptures teach us that there's, there's a way. There's a way that God figures out how to keep his promise. And I want to kind of go about it in a different way, so you have to bear with me. Christmas time is the time we celebrate God coming to be with us. See, he's not sending prophets or priests or kings or angels, right? He sends himself. But the more I've been meditating about that, it's like, how does he accomplish that? 
How does the holy, glorious God show up without killing us all? I've been thinking about that a lot. Christmas is God himself no longer sending but coming. And I want to I be drawn to all right now. And he chooses to do so as a baby. Okay. And the more you read about like Christmas time and devotionals, there's a bunch of dead dudes all over the place that have all tried to figure out like, what is the way that we can describe for people the fact that God becomes a baby, becomes a man? And so I've just been thinking about that. And there's some things I've read in the past that of people who've tried to meditate deeply on like, all right, how does God show up without blowing us all away? How does God show up with, with any of us surviving, right? Like, how does that happen? He came as a baby. Why did he come as a baby? And so I just want to meditate on that aspect, and I hope it draws your heart to worship Jesus in a really beautiful and special way. Why does he come as a baby? Think of it like this. Write this down because I think this will help you worship at Christmas time in maybe a, a new, unique way. And it's the tender approach of incarnation. He couldn't come violently. He had to veil his glory, right? If he showed up in his full glory, we're done for, everybody. You know, if God even gives a hint of who he is, we would just run in abject fear because what? When the light shows up, the darkness scatters. And so he veils himself in flesh. But he veils himself even more. He doesn't show up like a strapping man, good-looking guy. Good, look at this guy. He's a born leader. Why? He's six foot three and 222 pounds of chiseled muscle. He's a good leader, all right? And if you don't think people think like that, why do you think cartoon characters of leaders always have a square jaw? Look into that. That's really weird. Okay. Leadership is a square jaw. Okay. Thank you for laughing, a few of you. I appreciate it. And so God, it's like we're all going to be blown away if he shows up. And he goes, okay, I can't even show up like a strapping, strong version of mankind. Isaiah 53 says that he was almost unrecognizable. That you wouldn't ever pick him out of a crowd at all. The most plain Jane kind of guy. Poor Jane. Whoever's Jane. She's shot. You're not plain. Man, I'm just a comedian today. All right. But nobody would look at him. Nobody would, would say that there's the leader that we've longed for. There's the rescuer. And so when I think of Jesus coming as a baby, it's his stooping down in a tender way to connect with you and me. There's a story by Walt Wangerin named, uh, he's a great storyteller. This guy does excellent work. And it's an Advent narrative. And he writes a little story where he describes the world as a single broken woman. And uh, she's living in impoverished conditions She's been abused. She's been rejected. Uh, she lives in fear of others and herself. She's just a very fragile, fragile person. And so in this little story, the, the world is a single broken woman. And God, in the story, is on a mission to get to her. How do I get to this broken person? How do I connect? How do I keep my promise to someone who's been so sinned against and has sinned themselves? 
And so a song was written by Andy Gullihorn and Jason Gray. And I know like I'm breaking every rule in preaching here. So deal with it. All right. I'm going to read all the lyrics to the song. I thought about singing it and I said, nah, that'd be too many jokes on the same day. So, wonderful. Little, guys, the story is only three pages long. Come on now. I could have read that. But I, I, I like the way they put it into lyrical form. At the end of this rundown tenement hall is the room of a girl I know. She cowers behind all the deadbolt locks, afraid of the outside world. So how should I come to the one I love? I will find a way. Many thieves and collectors have used that door, but they only brought her shame. So she won't even open it anymore. Still I will find a way. I could call out her name. This is God saying, I could go and speak. I could call out her name with love through the walls, but condemnation is all that she will hear. I could break down the door and take her into my arms. God could just show up, but she just might die from the fear. So how should I come to the one that I love? I will find a way. I will find a way. How should I come to the one that I love? I will find a way. No hiding place ever kept her safe. So she hides inside herself. Now to reach her heart, the only way is to hide in there as well. I will hide in there as well. She gave up on love waiting for a change, but a change is coming soon. Because how could she not love the helpless babe that is waking in her womb? I found a way. I found a way. She'll know I am coming before I am here. And when she hangs her head, she'll see me there. And then when I come, she won't run away. All the beauty and joy will return to her face. And what of that loneliness? Now it is gone. Lost in the bond of a mother and son. Every sin that she suffered at the hand of men, every single disgrace will be washed clean again. I will love her completely. And when I am grown... I will carry her out of that tenement room. I'm doing a new thing. And soon you will see. I'm coming among you. And my name shall be. Emmanuel. How does God get to us? How does God get to us? without blowing us over. He comes in the most vulnerable way. A way that we would be open to it. Oh, maybe God does love me. Maybe God does care. Maybe God will keep his promise. And I think God coming as a baby has so many implications for you and for me. It's, it's his longing to be with us without destroying us. And I'm so thankful that God found a way. God found a way to show up and to reveal himself and to make his commitment to us. And I think that my desire for you is to lead you to wonder. Because if there was a promise and there was a problem, and there was a way, there needs to be wonder. We need to have just awe about the fact that God found a way to show up and to make you and I his children, to bring us home. 
to deal with our sin. To rescue us from our own misery. We don't even want God. We don't. The Bible says that we are his enemies. Our fist is, stand, uh, is, is in a clinch at him. We, we don't want him. And God just invades our world to bring you and me into his family. J.I. Packer says, the more you think about it, the more staggering it gets. Nothing in fiction is so fantastic as is this truth of the incarnation. And I'm just challenging you. Those of you that are Christians, I am challenging you. We are far too passive with these thoughts. We are far too passive. This is meant to be meditated on and dwelt on and and taken in and celebrated and to be a, a, a source of joy. God showed up. God longed to be near. And the real Jesus demands a response. And this is when I know that people that are so passive, I call it my shrug the shoulders response to God. I'm like, oh, what, what, Jesus, what Jesus are you thinking about? <laughs> You know, C.S. Lewis famously said that neutrality is irrational. There's no way that anyone who deals with the real Jesus is neutral. So if you have a passive response to Jesus, let me talk to people who don't know Jesus in here today. Again, you might have been coming for a few months. Maybe you've been a Christian for years. And the thing that bothers you a ton is you're like, why does everybody make such a big deal about Jesus around this place? Because he is everything. And if you are passive about Jesus, I don't know what Jesus you're dealing with. But it's not the one in the Bible. Because you're either going to repel him and hate him and be disgusted with him. This, who does this guy think he is? Oh, you're going to be drawn to him in adoration. It's one or the other. And I want us to not be like that. I do not want to be passive. I want to give Jesus the response that is due him. I want to live in awe and wonder of him. And so in conclusion, I want to tell you three things to do this week. What does it mean that the branch of the Lord who is Emmanuel, God with us. What does that mean for you this week? It means you can get very near. He has come and he wants to be accessible. He wants to be somebody that you interact with. You can open up the word. You can take time to pray. You can be intentional this Christmas and you're not going to get blown away. Because you stand in Jesus' righteousness, you now can boldly come to the throne of grace. God is near. So get near to him. Get near to him. Give adoration. Give adoration. Find ways, I don't know, if you just do it in your heart or if you have to write out you know, a journal or if you just need to play some music, I do that. Like, I, one of the albums I, I told you I listened to from beginning to end, I don't listen in part, not going to happen, it's Behold the Lamb of God by Andrew Peterson. So I listen to that album, and I always sing the last song. Behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. I want you to adore Christ this Christmas. Adore him, be be in awe of him. That is a worthy response. And get comfort. Get comfort this Christmas. Maybe you're, you're lonely. Maybe you're going through uneasiness in your life. Financially. Plans. Nothing's working out. You had it all figured out and it's all a mess. What are you going to do? Work harder. Plan harder. That's what some of you do. You crazy people. Get comfort that God knows and God is there. And just med med meditate on what I said in the beginning. We are specks. 
the size of the United States, there's a coffee cup. And our solar system is in that coffee cup. And in that coffee cup is a little speck called Earth going in circles. And there's a bunch of specks on that. And God loves you. And Jesus became a speck. And all he got was mistreatment, rejection, abandonment. And he got slaughter. Because he wants to take all those little specks and he wants to take them home. Get comfort this Christmas. God cares for you. God loves you. And he's demonstrated it. I agree with one of my professors from college. He used to say, I don't want to be overly harsh with people in counseling. He goes, but if anyone ever even hinted that I don't think God loves me, he wanted to scream blasphemy. How can we say God doesn't love us? Doesn't it feel blasphemous, like, just to slap him in the face for all that he's done? And so God loves us. I hope you will get near this Christmas, give adoration, and get great comfort that our Emmanuel has come. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you, God, for your word. I thank you, God, so much that you kept your promise Lord, you went into great lengths to continue to give us hope that you will keep your word. Thank you, God, that you showed up as a little baby so that we wouldn't run from you, that we wouldn't disintegrate in the glory of God's presence. And so, God, you found a way to come to earth and to be a human and to live our life and to die our death. And God, you raised your son from the grave, vindicating him and exalting him with a name that is above every name. And I pray that we would do that today in some small way. May we exalt the name of Christ. May we elevate it in some poor fashion to its rightful place. He is worthy of our adoration, of our service, of our commitment, of our obedience. And so may we live for our great Savior. And Lord, if somebody in here doesn't know Christ and they just really felt compelled in their spirit to deal with the real Jesus today, even as we're singing, can they just cry out to God and say, God, forgive me for my sin. I trust you. Be the boss of my life. Be the king of my life. Call the shots forever because you're God. And I pray, God, that you would bring more specks into your family today. In Jesus' name, amen.